Welcome to the first video interface. The magazine version has been around for some 14 issues, during which time it's become progressively more colourful, more packed with news and information. Now, some 18 months after the original launch, here we are with the first video. In this first edition, you will have the opportunity to see and hear items not only about current news, but also about future developments and products, many of which are not yet on the market in the UK. Providing comprehensive, up-to-date information is one of the many value-added services at which JWP excels. Video Interface's future depends on you. If you like it, tell us. If you don't like it, tell us. In the cassette you will find a reply paid card, which I'd be very grateful if you'd fill out. It will really help us. Here's edition one. Welcome to edition one of Video Interface. Right up front, here's what we think may be a helpful idea. Stand by to hit the pause button because we're going to put on a two second caption with an index of the rest of the tape. All timings are taken from now. Coming up, we have Michael Rod investigating multimedia for us. We have a first look at the Hewlett Packard DeskJet Portable, the only one in the country currently and not released across Europe until February of 1993. We also have a couple of interviews. David Godwin, General Manager of WordPerfect in the UK, will be here to talk to us a little later. But right now, we have with us Jeremy Brown of Symantec. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Jeremy, Symantec is a small company selling nice little utility programs, antivirus, software, and so on, right? I think we're rather more than just a, a utility company. Um, if I can give you some idea of the pedigree of the company, we're um, a $200 million US company. Um, $200 million posted last March. Um, we have uh, over 900 employees in 35 locations um, across the world. Um, we have uh, eight uh, international offices in Australia and uh, Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Holland, uh, Italy, and of course here in the UK. Um, we have over uh, 35 products translated into 11 languages. So I think we're rather more than just a, a, a small utilities company. Um, there's no doubt that we're, we're best known for our uh, Norton products, our Peter Norton products. Um, and I guess that uh, does take up the, uh, the larger share of um, our revenues. But we're involved in, in uh, many other areas of, of software. And uh, broadly speaking, the company is involved in four areas of, of software. Uh, productivity applications, in uh, system utilities, of course, with the Peter Norton products, in uh, languages and development tools, and in client server. Uh, we have the first two covered pretty healthily already with um, our Q&A product and our timeline products in database and uh, project management on the productivity applications. We have system utilities pretty well covered with, um, as you mentioned, with uh, antivirus products, our world-beating Norton, Peter Norton Utilities uh, product and uh, the Norton desktop for Windows. And uh, on the uh, development tools and languages side, uh, we're the de facto standard on uh, Macintosh platform with the Think Technologies products. And uh, recent acquisition um, of the Zortec product line uh, brought us C++ for Windows, DOS, and OS2. Uh, we're currently not yet in the client-server market, but uh, this is our, our firm intention. So I. Uh, I, I think I have to refute your <laughs> earlier comment that we're just a utilities company. I, I rather expected you to disagree, I must say, that, and I, I do stand corrected. But let me put this to you. You have products for DOS, uh, for Windows, and for Macintosh. But clearly out there, there's, there's Unix, there's NT coming along, um, and the horizon, shall we say, looks pink uh, at the moment. Uh, don't you feel that perhaps to properly address the corporate marketplace, you need to widen the number of platforms that your products cover? Well, of course, uh, we are um, constantly looking at uh, new operating systems and new environments for our products. Um, we're currently heavily into Macintosh, DOS, uh, Windows, and, and OS2. Um, but you're right, there's Unix out there, there's obviously NT coming along, and uh, you referred to uh, Pink, the Telligent product, the project. Um, uh, all of those things are of interest to us. 
And um, uh, I think uh, the exciting thing as far as uh, Symantec is concerned is that um, as well as having products on the major platforms at the moment, we're putting a lot of uh, time and effort into um, a project which we call Bedrock. Mm. Um, Bedrock is effectively a, um, a selection of uh, reusable software components which, can be, which are hardware independent. And the idea is that we will build our products over time using this bedrock technology, which will mean that de facto, when we are um, putting together a product such as Q&A, for example, using the bedrock technology, that we are automatically developing our products for all the major operating systems. At the moment, uh, Bedrock is available f uh, for our uh, development work on um, uh, Macintosh, DOS, and OS2. Um, we're developing actively for NT. Uh, and as the other operating systems emerge, we will obviously put together Bedrock technology for, um, for, for those operating systems. Mm. So in, in, it's a core code? In, in it, it is a core technology, and it's effectively the foundation on which all of our products in future will be established. And, and furthermore, um, we have, a, um, we have a, um, it's an endorsement from, from Apple Computer as their preferred uh, method of developing applications. Um, and indeed, we hope to make Bedrock available to um, other software developers um, so that they, as they are developing a product for one particular operating system, they're not uh, wasting their effort in terms of providing it on other platforms as well. Does this mean that we should see almost simultaneous releases then of, of a new product across different platforms in future? That's very much the intention. Uh, simultaneous products across platforms and also because of the way that uh, Bedrock has been put together, it'll allow us to um, develop and launch products in different languages at the same time as well. Mm. So the plan ultimately is to be able to do simultaneous launch of products across platforms and languages. Mm. Okay, let, let me tackle you on one other uh, thing. You've had some criticism recently about support. Um, I'm sure that a few people maybe watching this video will have had a few stories to tell. Uh, you recently moved support uh, totally out to Holland. Um, could you comment on, on how that transition is going? Well, I think it would be completely wrong to say that we haven't had our teething problems with, uh, with the uh, move to the European support strategy. They've been mainly, um, uh, mainly based on uh, technological problems we've had with uh, lines, lease lines to our uh, headquarters in Leiden. And in fact, our move in the next couple of weeks to new premises in Maidenhead will make a significant difference to the technology that's involved in getting local calls routed through to our headquarters in Leiden. Um, we think that our strategy is the right one, and I believe that we've ironed out most of the problems that uh, that users have, have discovered and, and told us about. Um, basically, our um, support approach is to have a um, a group of uh, multilingual support specialists in our um, headquarters in Leiden, and for each of the countries around Europe to have local country numbers that are hooked straight through lease lines to our headquarters in Leiden where the number of people that we can have at the end of the phones will handle both peaks and troughs in demand for support. Thank you for coming in and sparing us some time. Thank you. Darren Smithson went recently to the interactive and multimedia event Time 92. This is the report he brought back with him. When I visited last year's show, it proved to be one of the most memorable events of the year, mostly because the multimedia industry finally appeared to be getting its act together. I expected good things, therefore, from Time 92, but unfortunately the show was very disappointing. There were two major reasons for this. First, the lineup of exhibitors was generally poor. The second reason, and this is true of the multimedia industry as a whole, is that most of the developers have failed to understand that they need to move away now from the GWIZ demonstrations and begin to show the corporate business world some practical benefits from multimedia. Having said that, there were a few encouraging signs. Some of the developers were talking about applications in the pipeline, and some even had beta versions on show. However, without doubt, the best effort came from Toshiba, who unveiled their new multimedia workstation, the T6400DXC, complete with some of the applications currently available. What is of particular note here is that Toshiba took the time to explain the benefits of having a multimedia unit that is fully portable. With the T6400DXC, for example, a user carries the unit with him, which he just has to plug in to begin. There are no lengthy configurations required once on site and no hoping that the location has all the equipment needed in the first place. The savings in time on just these two points alone give weight to Toshiba's argument that the portable solution is invaluable. If only many of the other multimedia developers would follow Toshiba's lead. 
Perhaps the real problem with the entire concept of multimedia is that there are so many different definitions and claims as to what it is and what it can be, the end result is people simply get confused. Having found Time92 so disappointing, therefore, we asked Michael Rod to investigate multimedia, to find out where the business benefits might be, and in particular to look at Tachiba's contribution to this new art and science. It's clear that one of the buzzes of the moment is multimedia, but I wonder how many potential users of this powerful technology still regard it as an IT solution that is in reality looking for a problem. Now, in many ways, that's an understandable point of view, because much of the excitement that's been generated around multimedia up to now has been about the technical achievement of marrying sound and pictures, in some cases live pictures, into the digital world of computer text, graphics and processing, all within the environment of a desktop PC. Now, of course, that achievement is indeed substantial, and engineers have got every right to be proud of it. But to potential business users, all that matters not a jot if it has no practical business application. Take a look at this. What we've got here is a very early piece of multimedia which was put together to test the concept of marrying moving images, graphics, broadcast approach, and to see if it was of any potential value to the business community. This is actually an exercise which allows people to test their assertiveness. How do they behave in front of other people? And using menus like this, it calls on standard graphics to set the scene. And then when it's established the basis from which it will work, this system is able to present six separate exercises and examples, which the user, and it can be an individual or a group, can select with the mouse and the cursor. Let's um, choose this one which is an exercise, clearly, which has got something to do with a business meeting. Here it comes. By the way, Pam, I want to leave item one till the end because I don't think it's very important. So uh, let's move on to item two, shall we? Item one's my subject. I've spent a week researching it. You can't just dismiss it like that. <laughs> what would you do? So, sound and pictures set the example. Now, the system uses computer text, and television graphics to challenge us to respond. Again, the cursor can be shifted around until we select the particular example that we're interested in. Um, let's suggest that our response would be number two. The system records that and immediately invites us to move on to try another example. But let's, for the purposes of this demonstration, draw your attention to this little icon down here, profile, at any time, a user can check what sort of assertiveness profile the system is giving us. Well, on that uh, single example, we've been rated aggressive. Not very good news. But you see, down here is an invitation to use the system to check what aggressive means. Layers of opportunity, variety of examples, flexibility of approach. When one business organization saw that, they immediately began to appreciate the benefits that multimedia could bring to sales presentations, to corporate meetings, to financial consultations, to product presentations, all over and above the clear opportunities that it presented in training and education. Multimedia became a fundamental part of long-term planning for the future. And don't forget, all of what you've just seen has been achieved within a standard PC. Well, standard-ish, to be honest, because there are a couple of extra boards in here to cope with digital sound and digital pictures. But this sort of application has become comparatively simple. And never forget, the PC on which it is running remains available for all the applications that you originally bought it for in the first place. Spreadsheets, database analysis, word processing. Multimedia becomes nothing more than just another powerful application, part of the logical evolution of a company's IT strategy. But talking of evolution, all of this is uh, three years old. Kit and the package that's running on it. Let's take a look now at where evolution is taking multimedia. This unit has been produced by a company which has truly focused on portable computing. The Toshiba range of PCs extends from versatile small notebooks like this to exceedingly powerful 
business machines like this power portable, the 6400. Now this unit is fitted in its lid with a high resolution thin film transistor screen. And we've linked it up to a conventional television monitor so that you can make a direct comparison between the quality of the two pictures. Let's get this uh, chap roaring down the slopes. It is a very powerful piece of equipment. An Intel 486DX processor running at uh, 33 megahertz, fast and potent. 200 megabytes of hard disk. Average access time, 12 milliseconds. Set up in a uh, Windows environment, this has all the capability of running every element of multimedia. Now in the next few weeks, software industry leader Lotus is going to be launching this. It's the latest version of 123. And this is all it is. All you get for your money. It's contained on one CD and there are no more than eight separate printed pages of product support. Because all the help you're ever likely to need on this package is now contained in multimedia format in the software itself. We've set up another computer so that we can have a preview of multimedia. One, two, three. For this demonstration, we're supposing that I'm trying to create a graph. Here it is, a conventional one, two, three graph over here. But to demonstrate the help that the system can give in its multimedia format, we've created this window here, and let's see how the product support works in the age of multimedia. Graph to identify the data. To begin, select the range. Select data so that the first column contains labels for the x-axis. Select up to six other columns that contain the data to be graphed. By default, one, two, three plots each column you select as a line. After selecting the range, choose Graph New. Specify a name. Select OK. Surely multimedia is important because it brings together so many different individual aspects of business communications that have in the past proved their worth. Now, all of them can be contained on one three inch CD and all can be applied on a powerful machine like the Toshiba 6400. JWP is already making arrangements to configure these powerful machines so that they can cost effectively deliver multimedia applications that suit you. And they're also recognizing how important it is to get the right advice so that you can develop software applications to meet your needs. Surely, multimedia is not an IT application that's going to get left up in the air. It's time to look at a few highlights from the many microcomputer industry news items that are around at the moment. The Windows applications market share war has taken on new dimensions recently. Microsoft have countered Lotus bundling of Smart Suite with Crown Systems by signing deals to put Microsoft Office on new 486 systems from Compaq, LNX, ICL and others. Until the 31st of December, all these 486 PCs will include pre-configured copies of Windows 3.1 and Microsoft Office. Lotus and Microsoft have promotions running with both Smart Suite and Office being available as competitive upgrades for £299 and Smart, and Smart Suite going for an unbelievably low £249 if you're already a Lotus user. It is arguable that offers such as these lower the perceived value of products such as Microsoft Office and Smart Suite. As a reseller, JWP would prefer to see the end of such promotions and indeed many of our corporate customers have objected to having to pay to have software deconfigured from bundled systems. Having said that, we'd not be fulfilling our responsibility to you, our clients, if we didn't point out that at least until the end of the year, there are some great software bargains to be had by ordering wisely. Other brief items include news from Aldus, who have announced Fetch. Fetch enables users on a Macintosh system to browse through and locate files containing images, animations and sound, thus neatly eliminating the problem of scrolling through text-only file names to locate a multimedia file. 
Ventura Software have just started shipping Ventura Publisher version 4.1 for Windows. Ventura Scan and Ventura Separator are now included, giving the software complete pre-press capability. Microsoft have just announced their long-awaited database application. It's now called Access, although we've been talking about it for some time as Cirrus. JWP will have evaluation copies in their library very soon for you to try out. Twain is a word you may hear more of. T Twain compliant software packages have the ability to call each other from within an application. For example, if you're using Corel Draw and you decide you need a different picture, a new menu item, Acquire, allows you to launch, say, an HP scanning package to scan the graphic. On closing the scanning application, the picture is automatically dropped into your original application into the item you were creating and in the correct format. Both the Windows and Macintosh environments will be seeing Twain compliant applications very soon. Interesting. Finally, the 5th of November was an interesting day for about 50 JWP customers who intended a unique non-disclosure seminar hosted jointly by us and WordPerfect. David Godwin, General Manager of WordPerfect UK, spoke about WordPerfect's new WISE strategy and their Customer Advantage program, which will totally change the way the WordPerfect do business with corporate organisations, and for the better, I might add. There were demonstrations of WordPerfect 5.2 for Windows, Office 4 and WordPerfect presentations, which has been receiving rave reviews from the computer press and, incidentally, will be Twain compliant. Also shown was WordPerfect Informs, a forms design and filling package due to ship in Q1 of 1993. So surprising were some of David's revelations, we thought they deserved a wider audience, so we'll be talking to him later in the program. Incidentally, if you'd like to be invited to the next JWP uh, series of non-disclosure briefings in January, return the Play Pay card with the appropriate box ticked. And now, here's Darren Smithson with a look at some new and innovative hardware. Thank you, Tim. Now, we have a little bit of an exclusive for you today. There can't be many people out there who fail to realize that Hewlett Packard have launched a new series of LazyJet printers, the LazyJet 4 series. The thing about these printers is that Hewlett Packard are claiming they are, they are actually part of a new generation of printer technology. So with us today, we have Nikki Yao, the printer program manager at Hewlett Packard. Nikki, why are HP making these claims about the new printers? OK, the LaserJet 4 has some key improvements over the LaserJet 3, which it's replacing. You can see here, from an aesthetics point of view, the, the design of the LaserJet 4, but we also have a much smaller footprint mm -hmm. on the machine, and the display is much easier to read. Okay. But really, the key benefits are in the area of things like the print quality, the paper handling, use in mixed environment, and the big speed improvements. OK, let's take that from the top. The printer quality, why is it better? Well, we've got a little demonstration here because I really think that seeing is believing with this printer. I press the button here. The print engine in this is a 600 dot per inch print engine and that's very important. But we've also maintained the resolution enhancement technology which we introduced with the LaserJet 3 in 1990. What resolution enhancement technology does outside of software, it's independent from, from the software, is smooth jagged edges, stair stepping and that sort of thing that you traditionally get with normal 300 dot per inch printing. So the actual output that you get people say is somewhere, looks somewhere between 800 and 1000 dots per inch. Okay you've got the 600 dpi printing, how are the software packages coping with the new technology? Well we've been working with the key software vendors for some long while now and 600 dots per inch does require software support. We will have shipping in the box. We have today the Lotus 123 drivers and also the WordPerfect 5.1 drivers. We now have the Windows 3.1 drivers available for 600 DPI support and imminently we'll be releasing the Windows 3 drivers. The key difference you really see in graphics and as I said, seeing is believing. So again, if I just show you here, we have both 300 and 600 dot per inch and really the, the seeing is the believing. OK, so that's the print quality aspect dealt with. Now, you mentioned speed differential. Just what is the speed differential between the 4 and the 3? I think the best way of uh, showing that is to actually show a live demonstration. We have two matched PCs here, two HP Vectras. Mm -hmm. We have got the same Windows document on each of them, and we're going to be printing out at 300 dot per inch to both the LaserJet 3 and the 4. So if you'd like to fire away, Darren. OK, hang on one second. Here, we'll get this going. 
Now the LaserJet 4 will print up to five times faster when you're comparing 300 dots per inch with 300 dots per inch on the LaserJet 3. Mm -hmm. When you're talking 600 dots per inch on the LaserJet 4, you have to remember that that's actually four times the amount of data compared with 300 dpi. And in fact, that will print at the same time as 300 dpi on the LaserJet 3, or maybe even a little bit faster. Okay, so the LaserJet 4 can handle four times the data at the same speed as the LaserJet 3. How can it do that? Well, we've done a number of things. They're both based on eight page per minute engines. Mm -hmm. But with the LaserJet 4, we've moved to a risk-based processor. What this means is that graphics, which often so heavy and, and slow to print, mm -hmm. are actually formatted and therefore print much quicker. Mm -hmm. As well as that, we have in fact enhanced the printer language, the PCL5 printer language. We've made a number of tweaks, if you like, mm -hmm. in terms of some more data compression, we have also improved the vector graphics capability, the GL2 portion of it. Mm -hmm. And we've also got some very clever memory management going on. Okay. So, I mean, obviously the LaserJet 4 printed a lot quicker than the LaserJet 3, so I'm convinced of that. Now, the third aspect was the paper handling. The key improvement that we've made in terms of the paper handling is that the LaserJet 4 is a standard, a dual bin machine. It's got two input trays. We have a 100-sheet multi-purpose tray here which can be adjusted to take envelopes. And we have a second 250 sheet drawer. Nice little uh, thing here is a fuel gauge. Shows you how much paper that you've actually got remaining in the okay. printer. We can also add as an option a third 500 sheet bin that again sits underneath. And a fourth input source is a 75 envelope powered feeder. Mm -hmm. The model we actually have here is the LaserJet 4M. And this is specifically the Mac and Mixed Environment product. This product builds on the 4 in that it has a local talk interface built in and it has PostScript and extra memory. The good news here is that when you've added PostScript, you will get automatic switching between the two languages. In terms of the interfacing, we have the serial and the parallel and a third modular interface. As I've said, in the LaserJet 4M, that is in fact already pre-configured with a local talk interface. But of course, in the normal 4, you can add any of the range of Jet Direct cards, the networking cards from HP, and also third-party connectivity cards. I'm sure that before I heard someone mention the word Bitronics when talking about the LaserJet 4. Could you please explain what that is? Okay, I'm, I'm glad you uh, picked me up on that one. Bitronics is a new specification of parallel ports that Tulip Hackard has developed jointly with Microsoft. And what this enables is, for the first time, two-way communication between the PC and the printer. What we're aiming to get is from within software packages, real mean meaningful status feedback messages mm -hmm. rather than just printer offline, things like toner low, door open, that sort of thing. The first application to take advantage of this Bitronics capability is HP Explorer. This actually ships in the LaserJet box. What this enables the user to do is access the remote control panel of the printer actually from the screen. So what it means is for people who today have to play around, perhaps they have older versions of software or whatever, mm -hmm. they have to play around to change number of copies. Indeed, they may have to change resolution or whatever. They can now do that from the screen. They don't have to go and play with the printer. Okay, so you've explained the differences between the LaserJet 4 and the LaserJet 3, but you did also promise to show us the DeskJet Portable, and I'm not letting you go out the door until you have shown us it. And I thought I'd got away with just talking about the laser printers. No, no such luck. You're in luck, Darren. We've actually got one here. This is the DeskJet Portable. And now I suppose you want to see it printing. Yes, please. All we're doing here today is showing you a sneak preview of this product because it's not actually going to be officially available until February of next year. Mm -hmm. However, I can tell you one or two things about it. It is a 300 dot per inch plain paper inkjet. It's compatible with our desktop model, the DeskJet 500. However, it's been designed to be truly portable and truly rugged. Ideal for throwing in the back of the, the car with your briefcase along with your portable mm -hmm. PC. And of course, it does have a 100-page battery life to it as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming in today to show us both the LaserJet 4 and, of course, the DeskJet Portable. Both the LaserJet 4 and the DeskJet Portable will be available as seed units from JWP in the near future. In the meantime, let's take a look at the 20 top-selling software packages in the UK at the moment.
With me now is David Godwin, General Manager of WordPerfect UK. Hello, David. Hi. David, uh, WordPerfect were the first company to provide a single license for Windows, DOS, uh, and, and OS2, uh, a concept that other manufacturers are really still not entirely catching you up with. But you're about to take the whole concept of licensing and grab it by the lapels and shake it again, aren't you? What's going on? Well, it's a bit of a moving target, the licensing issue. Um, if I just return to the DOS Windows OS2 issue, uh, the main reason we did that uh, was to address people's uh, current needs, that is, the investing heavily in uh, new computers, whether they move to stay with DOS, move to Windows, or get ready for OS2. Um, it's a difficult decision for them at this moment in time. What we're trying to do with our sort of what we call a word license, the Windows OS2 DOS license, is make it easy for them to choose so they can buy DOS today and when the machine is ready to run Windows or OS2, all they have to do is migrate the license or buy a new set of media. So there's no cost for doing that. It's been really well received. A lot of accounts want the freedom to choose rather than being forced in a particular direction. Um, so we're extending this, this license scheme um, really under the the guise of a new corporate account sales program called a CAP program, a Customer Advantage program. Within there, we're extending the multi-platform license to include not only DOS, Windows, OS2, Macintosh, Unix, and VMS as well. So if a user purchases WordPerfect for Windows and then in six months' time decides that they really need a Unix workstation to do the job that they're looking to do, they simply migrate that license. So we're changing the rules a little bit in the licensing game. Um, but really in response to our customers' demands. The ability for us to provide this multi-platform license really revolves around the fact that we're developing for so many different platforms, and I'll come on to that a little later, no doubt. Um, other licensing issues we're addressing under the Customer Advantage Program include the ability to have uh, concurrent network licensing, um, so that if there are 500 PCs within an organization, but if only 300 of them are going to be using WordPerfect at the same time, but you don't know which 300, we don't mind, you just need to buy a license for 300. Obviously the account would need to manage that installation. As well as that, we provide for home usage, so that uh, if a customer buys, again, a couple of hundred WordPerfect licenses to use in the office, and uh, the same individuals would like to carry on their work at home in the evening or the weekend if they want to, then that's fine. They can use the same license as long as the two aren't being used at the same time. Right. So there's a lot of variables in the licensing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, whilst I understand, um, as do you, that you're not talking to a non-disclosure audience here as, as you were um, on the 5th of November, what can you tell us about new products that are, that are coming? There's some fairly innovative and new breeds of software from WordPerfect on the way, aren't there? There are. We've, um, for the past year, uh, two been developing a series of applications that are designed to um, uh, help people in the way they deal with their information. We have a new strategy, the WordPerfect Information Systems Environment, or the WISE strategy for short. The key elements within there is the information sharing. And so our strategy and our new applications are built around this. It's a framework for our development and for the positioning of the new applications we're going to have. So we, we split this into three nice sections. We have information processing information sharing, and then information presentation. Now within the first category, we're placing our edit editing tools, WordPerfect, WordPerfect Works, um, and LetterPerfect to start with. Within that category though, we're making sure that we're increasing greatly the functionality into, uh, into which we build into WordPerfect. Um, so for example, there's a lot of debate right now that most word processors do just about everything anybody would ever want for them. Well, we still believe that there's a great deal more functionality can be built in. But as well as that, the challenge is to make sure that we make it even easier to use than it ever has been. So we're working hard in these areas. We're working hard to improve the integration that WordPerfect has, um, not only with our own applications, but with other leading applications. So we integrate well with other leading spreadsheet applications integrate well with databases so we'll be able to from within inside, with inside WordPerfect we'll be able to make calls out to popular databases like Paradox and DBase support for SQL as well. And further than that we're developing a series of APIs that we'll, uh, we'll make freely available to not only commercial developers but in-house corporate development teams so that they can very easily get their applications to integrate well with WordPerfect. So there's new versions of WordPerfect on the way. 5.2 for Windows is, is very close now. And in there, we've added in a great deal more functionality, improved the usability, 
and um, that's a year after the original upgrade, uh, the original release of WordPerfect for Windows. Yeah. Other key new applications that perhaps will uh, surprise a few people and show people more that there were more than just WordPerfect include WordPerfect Office. Now, Office has um, been around for a couple of years in, in different forms, and traditionally it's been based uh, as, a, as a message, a mail product. Um, what we're doing with Office 4 to ship in the first quarter of next year is change the standards a little bit and call it electronic messaging. It's uh, a re what we like to call real-world groupware, groupware that people can use today. So we're talking about electronic mail, group scheduling, and calendaring. Integrated into that, we're working with electronic forms. We have a product called WordPerfect Informs. And the forms, they can be printed, but the basis and the emphasis is along, dis along distributing these forms electronically around the network uh, using the password and signature for password and signature facilities that are in there to ensure that the uh, the forms are moving in the right way around the organization, introducing the concept of workflow. Um, our messaging product changes the rules on the competition a little in the fact that um, right now our mail, calendaring and scheduling products are three separate applications. With Office 4 they become one integrated application, making it easier and more natural for people to work as a group. So that's our sharing category. Um, to add to that, all of our applications will be mail enabled. We're providing for support for both Vim and Mappy based me messaging systems. Um, the third portion of our Y strategy was information presentation. And there we've released today, in fact, WordPerfect presentations for DOS, um, leading edge presentation graphics, getting some great reviews from the press, and really is uh, incorporating multimedia technology, helping people present their ideas better than they have ever before. Um, we're producing that for Windows and OS 2 as well. As well as that, we're working on some viewing tools that uh, effectively act like a runtime version of WordPerfect. So that again, if users uh, don't have access to the full WordPerfect system, but they need to read, view, print WordPerfect documents, they can do that through the WordPerfect viewing tools. So there's a lot of development work going on. Mm. So, it, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the word processor still remains the core as far as you're concerned, but it, it's going to become something from which you can reach out and grab all these other elements. Is, exactly right. right. You're exactly right. We see the document as the central point where information is going to flow. It, it started off as uh, word processing, and over the last couple of years or so, so with graphics and tables, so it became document processing. The next stage in our eyes is information processing, the document being the central focus of where information is dealt and uh, dealt with and then combined together and produced from there. Mm. You always had a very good, excellent re reputation for, for customer support, but perhaps your people are going to be spread a little bit too thinly when, with all this new stuff coming out. Well, not at all. There's the, we're certainly recruiting heavily for more support people. Uh, of our 180-odd people in the UK office, 75 of them work in customer support. That's a real commitment. And with that in mind, we're planning and we're recruiting right now to put systems engineers in the field so that we can provide better on-site support services. We're working on certification programs for consultants um, so that they too can become well qualified and, and skilled in our office products and our forms products um, so that they too can provide support in the field. We're also introducing new electronic support through BBS systems and even through our own mail products so we can hook up to accounts so we can com communicate more easily. Thank you very much for joining us today. No problem. And that's it for the first edition of Video Interface. Please do send back the reply paid card, it really would help us. One small change there, you may notice that the reply paid cards in fact mention an item by carriage. Uh, unfortunately, there just wasn't time to include them, so they're on tape and you'll see them on the next edition. That's it from us. Cheerio. Thank you.